Okay, today I'm unboxing three of, I would genuinely say, some of the most fascinating phones that have ever existed, but that people have just forgotten about. The first is the camera-focused Nokia 808 PureView. For some perspective, this was released in 2012, the time of the iPhone 4S and Siri and the Galaxy S2. But this phone right here, even though most people had never heard of it, was an absolute monster. We're quite used to seeing camera-focused phones now. You've got the Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra, you've got the Huawei P40 Pro Plus, but I would genuinely say that no phone camera has ever been this far ahead of its time. It made every other phone camera look like something you got for free with a McDonald's meal. To put a number on it, compared to the iPhone 4S it was up against, Nokia's camera sensor is almost six times bigger. It's still bigger than the main sensor on the $1400 Galaxy S20 Ultra from 2020. That's ridiculous. And it had all the camera bells and whistles, an ultra bright xenon flash, a two-stage shutter button that works like a proper camera's. It even had lossless zoom. Because the resolution is so high at 41 megapixels, when you zoom in, there's space to just crop into that without losing detail. I can think of a few phones that are released this year that are doing the exact same thing and still acting like it's revolutionary. 2012, people. 2012. But okay, you probably get the idea. This phone was described by The Verge as so far ahead of its competition that it has no competition. So how can something this groundbreaking become so quickly forgotten? Well, the most important failure was that Nokia underestimated the importance of software. The phone runs on a completely dead software platform called Symbian, and they even said themselves when they were launching it, look, we know this isn't the best software, but the camera tech is so good that we just needed to get it out for people to try it. But ironically, it was this rush that cost them. The camera is phenomenal, they weren't kidding, but it's so far ahead of the competition, Nokia could have spent three years working on the software and perfecting it, and they still would have been ahead. What people need is a well-rounded experience, an app ecosystem, balance, and that's not what Nokia delivered. So, okay, the phone flopped, but just before we get on to the next one, there is another reason we're talking about this. It's actually because of a video I saw a couple of weeks ago. Someone's done a camera comparison with this phone versus a Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra, a 2012 versus 2020 comparison, and they concluded that it was a draw. I watched this and I remember thinking, what a load of rubbish. What a steaming pile of... You get the idea. But just to be sure, I had to test it myself. Because if Nokia from eight years ago is better than Samsung in 2020, then that is embarrassing. But spoiler alert, it's not. The Nokia was phenomenal for 2012 standards. I would say it was at least three years ahead of its time, which is incredible, but it wasn't eight years ahead. In absolutely ideal conditions, it has the potential to look nearly as good as the S20 Ultra, but to focus on that would be ignoring the massive leap that modern cameras have made, which is the use of machine learning to be able to take great photos in any condition, with even a rookie doing the shooting. If you're enjoying this video, by the way, a sub to the channel would be amazing. Now, the second smartphone is interesting for a different reason. So, it's 2014, a couple of years after the Nokia, and the company Sharp surprised a lot of people. They brought out a phone called the Aquos Crystal, $150 for this. What? How did Sharp, of all companies, just jump in and outdo some of the highest end smartphones you could find? I remember there were a thousand articles covering it. There were tech YouTube videos filled with comments of, have you heard about this phone? And just generally excitement about having yet another global player in the smartphone market. So it's pretty clear that Sharp were onto something. And while that first Crystal phone is fairly well remembered, what most people don't know is they also made a flagship. They took those design cues that we loved about the $150 mid-range phone, and they gave us the high-end specs that we wanted. And that, my friends, is what you're looking at. This was, for most intents and purposes, a dream phone in 2014. Okay, let's be real for a minute. This is cool. That's me talking with my 2020 mindset. This 2014 phone hardware still looks and feels impressive. It's perfectly usable with one hand, thanks to the almost invisible bezels. It's got a decent 1080p display, and it's no powerhouse now with two gigs of RAM and a Snapdragon 801 chipset, but it can still run most apps without issue. Yeah, the software's kind of grim, but it's Android. That's a solvable problem. And I'm still yet to find a phone today that feels this edgeless. Do you remember that first Xiaomi Mi Mix phone that people were going crazy about? That was October 2016. Sharp did this two years prior. So. 
Why haven't you heard of it? Why is it that if you try and search for a review of this ludicrous Crystal X online, it's as if the phone never even existed? Why is it that if I go onto Sharp's US mobile website right now, it's quite funny, it's literally a blank page and not even a secure one. Well, they gave up, they were impatient. That first Aquos Crystal phone got people globally excited, and I reckon Sharp was just expecting it to be an instant hit in the US market, but it wasn't. And it kind of looks like Sharp just saw that and thought, okay guys, we tried, it's never gonna work globally. And they retreated, sticking to pretty much just releasing their future phones in Japan only. But I think they retreated too early. Think about this for a second. If you were gonna go out and buy some expensive clothes, for example, you probably have a fair bit of brand loyalty because if you're gonna spend $20 or $30 on a t-shirt, you've got to trust that it's going to last. And there's a similar thing going on with smartphones, but it's much more extreme. Getting a bad shirt, it might well ruin your day, but getting a bad smartphone could ruin your year. So what a company can't do in the smartphone market is drop an exciting new Android phone and expect it to just nuke the iPhone. It could have the coolest feature in the world. It doesn't matter. Because buying a smartphone is such an important, involved decision for people, you've got to build trust before you can even expect mass market adoption. So as a company, what you need to do is to keep making brilliant phones, to keep updating them and to just try that the word will spread. And I mean, if you've got a design like this, people are gonna ask you about it. This phone is six years old. If you try picking up the latest Google phone or the iPhone at the time, they look like artifacts in comparison. Through one impressed customer, Sharp could have reached 20, 30, 50 new customers just in the two year lifespan that a person uses that phone. But that's just the thing, word of mouth takes time. And time is not what Sharp gave themselves. The reason I included this phone in the video is because I was personally bummed about it. If this is what they did in 2014, imagine what they could have made today, six iterations later. It's just a shame. Okay, the third phone I wanna to talk to you about is from Samsung. Let me set the scene. It's 2007, Apple's just dropped the iPhone. The mobile phone market has been flipped upside down. But what does Samsung launch in that same year? You might think an Android competitor. Nope, their highest end phone was this. This is the Samsung Serenata. And as you can probably tell by the packaging, in their eyes, this was a huge deal. A $1,000 collaboration between them and Bang & Olufsen. And there's a very specific reason why I'm showing you this. So the first thing you'll see is the phone. I'll get to that, it's pretty weird looking I know. And below that an almost illegal amount of cardboard and then what looks like a cable spaghetti at the bottom. It's quite nice stuff, a soft touch pouch. You've got Bang & Olufsen earphones, which I guess were pretty cool in 2007 and a dock, not too dissimilar from the wireless charging docks you see today. I feel like this doesn't need saying, but the Samsung Serenata is a very odd piece of hardware. It's got a partially touchscreen display combined with actually one of the best spin wheels I've ever used. But let's be honest, it looks terrible. I think in a best case scenario, like a slightly awkward TV remote. The reason for that is that it's a music focused phone. So the interface controls pretty similarly to an iPod with the two special features being a built-in stand on the back and a full size speaker hidden inside the phone. It's about as good as most 2020 smartphone speakers. But okay, why are we talking about this strange contraption? Well, Samsung today, is considered top of the game. Every new smartphone is right at the bleeding edge. But the reason we're looking at this is that it's a stark reminder that until a couple of years after the iPhone, Samsung was a very different company. A company whose entire strategy seemed to be, let's see what people like and copy it. And subtlety wasn't their strength. Take BlackBerry, they were doing great at the time. And guess what? Samsung saw this and created, can't even make this stuff up, the Black Jack. Or Motorola, their Razer phone was literally one of the best selling phones of all time. So Samsung made a counterpart and thought, what comes after Razer? Oh yeah, Blade. We'll call ours the Samsung Blade. So anyways, the Serenata was just a continuation of this trend. Samsung saw the success Apple was having with its iPods and they basically copied Apple's homework while improving a few things like the audio quality. But this probably comes as a surprise to nobody, it flopped. Holding it next to the iPhone, which you could buy for literally half the price, it's not surprising, but this failure is a demonstration of a bigger point. I'm holding two very different looking phones, yes, but also two phones created with a completely different mindset. Samsung on the left was basically trying to give people what they wanted. It was an evolution, but the difference with the iPhone was that it was trying to give people what they didn't know they wanted. 
a revolution. If you'd asked people in 2007 what they thought a phone should have, they would have said, give me a more colorful screen, or give me a more solid hinge, or better quality keys to type with. Nobody would have said, I want a phone that's just a screen and a home button. It's like, imagine the time before cars. If you'd asked people what they'd wanted, they would have said, give me a faster horse. So the point I want to make with this phone is that you can have success by copying people, but you'll only get so far. To get right to the top, you've got to not just give people what they want at the time, but you've got to give people what they want before they even know they want it. And you can say for sure that that is something Samsung does now much better than they used to. But that being said, my name is Aaron, this is Mr. Who's the Boss, and I'll catch you in the next one.